Joe. Joseph, this is Rhett Nelson calling. Rhett, I expected your call. Good to, good to hear from you. Yeah, good to talk to you today. I'm really excited because I am a huge John Wayne fan. Just to kind of give you a little background on my interest, I, um, like I mentioned, when I was a little kid, like John Wayne was really the first thing I wanted to be when I grew up. I was also a big fan of James Arness. He, Matt, Matt Dillon, John Wayne got him the role. Right, right. Uh, J- James Arness has said that John Wayne was sort of his mentor. And in the same way, John Wayne considered John Ford to be his mentor. I, in just kind of prepping for this interview today, I was kind of, I actually learned a few things about uh, Wayne and Ford's relationship. They, you know, I kind of always assumed that they were just kind of chummy, that they were just really good friends, but their their relationship was very complicated. Though they were very good friends, it was very complicated. Um, do you want to go ahead and talk about that? Well, I... Uh... When I when I write about Ford and Wayne uh, in the book, what I what I try to stress is that uh, they really sort of became what the other never had, which was on Wayne's part a uh, kind of a, a solid Potter familias, strong father figure, and then for Ford uh, a son who was you know obedient and loving and warm and affectionate because both men had hugely hugely dysfunctional uh, personal family lives. Uh, John Wayne, as I'm sure you know, was a product of a very, very cold and loveless union of of his mother, who did not like him and made it clear through her whole life uh, he was not the preferred son. So he was kind of damaged goods from his early years. In the same way that Ford, who was the product of a very loving, warm family relationship, became enmeshed in a, in a morass of dysfunction with his own kids. So his son Patrick and him never, never got on, and they sort of stopped talking after after 1956 or 57. So in a in a in a certain way, they became the father and the son. The other one never had, but like you said, that does not come. It does not come with his own boatload, without his own boatload of of huge dysfunctions and problems and complications, and uh, which Ford never, you know, resolved. Towards Duke because as Ford's star began to settle and sink in the Hollywood sky, you know, by the early '60s, John Wayne was a megastar of you know universal proportions, the most famous American movie star in the world, and Ford was kind of on his way to become a relic. In the same way, John Wayne, as the Duke, could never get out from underneath Ford's shadow, and every time Ford would show up, Duke would basically turn into a, a, a little boy and a puppy dog, very uh, obedient. And that sort of dogged him his his entire life. So you're right when you say there was a lot of unresolved complications, despite the fact they had great great love and obviously a great collaboration with each other. I'm I'm really kind of interested in how the two of them first teamed up. I mean, I know I was I heard that when John Ford first came to Hollywood, he wasn't necessarily planning on becoming a director or an actor. He was just kind of following in his brother's footsteps. Right. Is that true? Oh yeah, uh, because Francis uh, Jack was still in his in his teens, or maybe even younger, in Portland, Maine, when they found out uh, Francis, who had uh, taken a powder and disappeared into the void, reappeared uh, in a movie theater as a, a matinee idol. And it's uh, when uh, after that that Jack, in, uh, opting to forego a, a university career in school, decided to go out to Hollywood and bum around with his older brother. Frank, who was on his way to becoming one of the most famous directors of the silent era, and obviously you know what happened with that. Um, you know, it was a reversal of fortune. Within a couple of years, Frank had tanked, and Jack was now one of the top directors. But it was really, it was, he was just sort of maundering about in his, his older brother's shadow. No desire to get into directing, no real focus in that area. He just wanted to make a living, and that was the best way that he could do it, was to, to work for his brother. But he kind of learned the way monkeys do, just by watching watching their elders. Right, right. And then when John Wayne came to Hollywood, he was kind of coming more from a, wasn't he kind of a prop guy? or? And right, then, yeah, he was, uh, before the unions took over and regulated all the do's and don'ts, you could go over and, and, and get a job just being a, being a stuntman and being a gopher. So, yeah, Duke was on uh, uh, summer. He was looking for summer work because he, uh, he was going to USC where he hoped to study law. And uh, his football career was, uh, was over because of, of a shoulder injury. So he basically was just going over and doing, uh, doing odd jobs, gaffing and 
uh, stunt work, prop work, um, but uh, Ward Bond did the same thing, and so that's how how the three of them all all connected. Okay, okay. Now the one movie that kind of st- began their whole relationship is the first major movie was The Big Trail. Uh that was uh, that was the, the the biggest blessing and the biggest curse in uh, Duke Wayne's life because uh, Fox, which was Ford's uh, Ford's home studio before it became 20th Century Fox. Uh, Fox was planning toying around with the 70 uh, millimeter experimental widescreen format, while Walsh, who was uh, casting around for a young cowboy star, uh, so this is 1929, and uh, Pappy recommended Duke for the role of the uh, the lead, the young lead, and thank God the movie tanked. It was a it was a blessing in disguise because the uh, depression hit. Uh, the, the, the theaters across the country could not afford the 70 millimeter cameras, and so that's when Duke disappeared into oblivion for the next 10 years until until Stagecoach. But had he, and this is uh, this is all speculation at this point, Brett. But had he become a star, I doubt if uh, if Ford would have you know taken charge of his career and they would have had the great collaboration. He probably would have just been like uh, Orson Welles, who said, you know, I started at the top and worked my way down. Where his first movie, at the age of 25, 26, he was, you know, he did the greatest work of his career, and it was all downhill from that. So, could have been a could have been a mixed blessing, but fortunately, um, you know, the, the movie tanked. But a sidebar to that is that, you know, Ford had a very peevish quality to him, where if he felt jilted, if he felt left out or disrespected, that was it. Curtain came down, phone went silent. So after Ford uh, recommended Toop for the role. To Raul Walsh, after Duke took it, Ford all of a sudden cut off all communications with John Wayne for about three or four years, and he never could figure out why he did it. But he seems to think that it had to do something with the fact that you know Raul Walsh was now going to be his mentor. So Ford is you know very 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 funny very funny character very very complex figure. What was the uh, the film that John Ford reached out to John Wayne and you know kind of offered him a small walk on part? Uh, he was propping for, he was doing the prop work for, uh, Mother McCree. Some people say, uh, some of the authors, uh, say Mother McCree that, that have done, uh, biographies of Ford, which was a film from, uh, the late twenties. Others, and I say this in my book, it's, um, uh, Four, Four Sons, I believe. Four Sons. And, uh, Ford was, you know, noticed this kid, so he, he continued to let him do prop work. But it was, uh, the film Salute. Uh, a few years later, in 1929, where he had his first speaking role as a Annapolis midshipman, along with Ward Bond. Uh, so I think I don't know. Do you have do you have different information than that? But I believe it was Salute that uh, he really started becoming uh, more and more prominent in the films. I don't know the the movie. What was it that Ford saw in what made him want to kind of recruit this young kid uh, to you know to be in his movie? Well, I, I, I think that if you put it in context, um, the great the romantic story would be that, you know, they, uh, they met, like, supposedly David O. Selznick met Scarlett O'Hara at the burning of Atlanta on the, the back lot, and by the, the light of the dying flames, he saw his Scarlett O'Hara, which, of course, is not, is not true, and it's not true with, uh, with, with, with Pappy and Duke. It was a long evolutionary process. At the beginning, you just saw him as a, this big, lunky kid, uh, who was following him around like a puppy dog, had this, this case of hero worship. But if you put it in a larger context, if you look at Ford's career, what John Wayne evolved into, Wayne, Wayne owed the majority of his, the bulk of his, his characterization, strong, silent persona, kind of a lonely, majestic figure. That all comes from Harry Carey. And Wayne would say that throughout his career. He said his walk, his look, his talk, the way he would stand, the way he would dress, everything he owed to Harry Carey. And Harry Carey was nothing more than a big, Ham actor from the East Coast, from New York, who came west, and like all these other stars in the silent saw, the Western is a way to s- sort of refine a language of mythology and use it as a primer of sorts. So Wayne really, in a, in a sense, after uh, Carey had a falling out with Ford and they went their separate ways, Wayne sort of stepped into the breach that was already kind of filled by the Harry Carey character. And I think in many ways Ford saw him as a continuation of that type of character, which is what was evolving as Ford's mythological cowboy, as opposed just to the glitzy rodeo, 
you know, the uh, embroidered shirts and fancy horsemanship of the, the, the Tom Nick, some of Gene Autry and Roy Rogers. Kind of this existential character that, you know, first it was, it was Harry Carey, then it was George O'Brien, and then it was Henry Fonda for a while. And then it was Duke Wayne. Duke Wayne in 1939 was stagecoach, really stepped into, uh, but there was, he was standing on the shoulders of people before him. So I think Ford basically saw him just as a continuation of a characterization he had already begun to explore and develop. Huh. That's, that's interesting. And in fact, it's interesting that you mention that because I was actually reading that at one point in his career, he made the, the comment, something to the effect that it's easy to take an actor and teach him to act like a cowboy versus taking a cowboy and teaching him to be an actor. <laughs> Brilliant. Something that to that effect. What, and that applies perfectly that, to what you just said. Yeah, well, he it, it, that was what, what Ford said, right, about uh, about acting. It was, it was yeah. what Ford said or what Wayne? It was, it was something Ford said about um, Western actors. True, I think that that's what, what you're saying, Rudd, is, is probably most patent, uh, patently manifested in, uh, in Stagecoach, where he destroyed, I mean, he destroyed Duke Wayne. Up to this point, they were, they were drinking buddies and sailing buddies and hanging out with Ward Bond, going on fishing trips. But when he got him into uh, the arena in Stagecoach, it was like he just got off a bus at, uh, at a Marine Depot. He took him apart. Mm-hmm. He just destroyed him because he knew exactly what you pointed out. You've got to take him apart. And you got to rebuild him, and give him a matrix, give him a context in which this persona can, you know, speak to something larger than just cattle rustling and shoot 'em ups in the in the town saloon. So he did. He destroyed Wayne, and he never ceased doing that on uh, on film. Sometimes it was playful and funny. Other times, like when they were making, they were expendable. Right after the war, it was absolutely brutal. It was it was shamefully brutal. But it, he never ever uh, uh, stayed his hand when it came to, uh, uh, or spare the rod when it came to Duke. Literally would, would pummel him to, up to the time they made their last movie, which was uh, Donovan's Reef in 1963. So oh, okay. pretty brutal stuff. Right, yeah, yeah. And yeah, Ford had the, quite the reputation of being a very uh, almost Nazi like director as far as how he treated people. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Fairly good, yes. Yeah. So there are people that would say you're even being kind with, with that term. Uh, yeah. Um, but going back to Stagecoach, though, Stagecoach is the, the one film that began uh, the John Ford-John Wayne relationship. They went on to make, what was it, something like 15 movies together after Stagecoach? Uh, together about... I, uh, or was it more? Seven or eight. Oh, seven or eight? It was about seven or eight movies, yeah. Yeah, I have to, uh, I have to double check. I'm... It's the simple questions that I get tripped up on, Red. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. No problem. But I should know that. No, no problem at all. Um, Stagecoach was the first serious Western movie. Why was the Western genre kind of looked down upon? Well, I, in, in many respects, I think that the Western sort of reached its peak in maturity in the, in the silent period. Uh, we had great directors and producers like, um, like, uh, like, like Ford and Francis Ford, his older brother, Thomas Ince, even D.W. Griffith uh, did, did several, you know, very, very fine westerns. And uh, by the time sound came around, and the, I'm sorry, by the time the, the Roaring Twenties came around, the idea of the cowboy started to become a little bit more passe because America was in the full flush of the jazz age, and they wanted it girls, and they wanted brilliant teen heroes with, like, uh, Valentino. And you had the uh, cinema until the, the Hayes office came in and cleaned it up. You had the the, the films, uh, Hollywood, basically going off in these very wild, naughty directions. And the whole idea of the cowboy became sort of an in-joke. By the time the 30s rolled around, they were reduced to, the Westerns were reduced to just quick, cheap, money-making enterprises done in five days at Monogram and Mascot Studios. So it really had fallen on hard times. And uh, I just think it, it, it fell out of favor in, in, in terms of the Depression. Uh, the whole idea of the noble, heroic, cowboy began to be seen as retrograde because of the conditions, the socioeconomic conditions, and then you saw the rise of anti-heroes. We think that was a term for the 60s and the 70s, but actually it's from the 30s. Guys like Spencer Tracy, Paul Muni, Jimmy Cagney, uh, these sort of angry, drifting, Bogart, every man. Uh, so it really, that the whole language really became passe until, until 39. Where he, he gave the gave the, the the western guts again. I, I could use a different part of the anatomy, but I have to say guts. He gave it, <laughs> put the put the teeth back into uh, into the western. Yeah, yeah. 
in thinking about westerns, you know, yeah. I, I gotta I gotta mention John Ford's classic statement of how he always introduced himself. I'm John Ford, and I make westerns. Why westerns? Do you know what, uh, Red? Uh, honestly, if you read a lot of the interviews that Ford gave, he, he would casually disavow the fact, that, uh, especially the guys from Europe who just, you know, the, the French and the, and the British and the Germans were always over the moon about the Westerns. And then that was the international calling card of American mythology. But Ford would angrily shut him up and, and shut him down and say, I, I don't like the Western. I have no particular affinity. You people are, are overlooking all the social dramas and love stories and Irish movies that I, that I do. He says, I really don't have a particular affinity, but, but that was another part of Ford's craftiness of his persona. Every time you try to nail him down on one thing, he just get out from underneath you like Mercury um, and go in another direction. But I think the two reasons, I think the, 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 the Western, if you look at his career, he made Westerns, went back West. Every time his career started to tank or he had a big failure, he would turn around and he would look and do a Western because they were always quick, easy to do. He was familiar with it, but also on a deeper level, and that's why I call it Poet in the Desert, that's the subtitle of the book, I think that the, the Western, especially the good Westerns that he did in the, the 40s and the 50s, spoke to a basic solitude in the American nature, uh, the American character that was so manifested by John Wayne and Henry Fonda. I think it, was, it, it just bespoke his own kind of loneliness in, in the seeing the, maj- the, the majesty of Monument Valley and being absorbed into that vast space. For him, it presented sort of an existential expression of, of these deep themes in, in his own life, ritual, tradition, history. He had a great love for me. He was a highly intelligent man, very well read, very conversant in, in several languages. So he, I think that he always saw um, something about the myth of the West as not just American history, but tying the deeper themes that were, that were Irish, that were Catholic, that were have its roots in, in, in Shakespearean drama and antiquity. Um, so that was, that was it, it bespoke the man's own a very high intelligence and, and thoughtfulness and ultimately his own loneliness, I think. Uh, John Ford, I think he still holds the record for the number of Academy Awards. You might have to double-check my, uh, my map, but I think Spielberg may have edged him out because uh, he won four for his own direction, but then uh, I say he won six because he won two for documentaries, directing the documentary uh, December 1941, December 7, 1941, and Battle of Midway. Uh, as to whether or not those constitute his own personal Oscars, I think it's, uh, it's uh, splitting hairs. I say six. Some people say four. So Spielberg may have edged him out for that. I, I, I don't know, but I, I, I think he does still hold the record. Well, at any rate... I mean, like you said, he was a very intelligent person, and, I mean, he, he set a standard in Hollywood that directors today even are trying to use his methods of directing. I think it was Orson Welles who said something yes. like Stagecoach was his quick crash course in filmmaking before he made Citizen Kane. Um, yeah, watch it 25 times. Watch Stagecoach on the set of uh, Citizen Kane. He came from the theater. This guy, he, he was 20, 24, 25. He didn't know anything about it. He didn't know when to end of the camera from the other. It was basically it was Greg Toland and Herman Mankiewicz that really, really informed him about the realities of filmmaking. But in terms of composition, you're right. He watched Stagecoach over and over and over again. And when you started off by saying Orson Welles, I thought you were going to say his famous comment that he made to Peter Bogdanovich when Bogdanovich asked him his favorite directors, and he says, "Well, I prefer the old masters," by which I mean John Ford, John Ford, and John. Oh Ford. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Isn't that a great line? Yeah, that is a great line. I came across that yeah. actually. You know, if you watch John Ford's movies, I don't know, I guess me personally, I would compare him to almost like a painter for movies because he has these really broad uh, cinematic shots that he likes to take. And it's just rather interesting that the industry considers him quite the artist, whereas John Ford, he, he put that comment down. He's like, it's, you know, anyone can be a director. It's not art. All, all you got to yeah. know is got to be able to know when to film the actor's eyes, and everything else just kind of takes care of itself. Right. That's what uh, Steven Spielberg said, and uh, there's a great documentary. It's an updating of the 71 documentary directed by John Ford that they reshot in 2008, I believe, with uh, interviews by Spielberg, Scorsese, Eastwood. Spielberg, when he was about 16 years old, actually met Ford, went into his office, and you talk about crash courses. In five minutes, he told him, he said, you want to make pictures, kid? And he says, you just have to know where to place the camera. He says, what do you mean? He says, well, look at that painting. Where's the, where's the horizon? It's up here. 
go to the next painting. Where's the horizon? It's down there. He says, just know where to put your horizon, and that's going to determine whether you have a good shot or not. Very simplistic answer, but the, the fact is that when he was young, when he was a boy, Ford was steeped in the study of painting. He, he knew the Hudson Valley, the Romantics, uh, George Catlin, uh, the great Western painters, Remington, Russell, Schreibogel, and he studied them. He, he poured over volumes of, of art. So, yeah, there was, a, there was an, an intuitive sense, but it was also steeped in a scholarly research of, of painting, of composition. And that's, that's, like you said, let your cameraman do the work. Just know what you want to do and let him, let him he knows what he's doing. Film the eyes. And most important, you're talking about a man who was clinically blind for most of his life, and he lost the use of his left eye, which is why he always wore the eye patch, after the 19, after like 1952-53. So you're talking about a man who continued, like Monet, to create these magnificent vistas when he was legally blind. I mean, isn't that, it's just it's amazing when you think about that. Yeah. And that and that's cool, too. I didn't even know he would had background in painting, but that makes sense because, I mean, his... His uh, camera shots very much demonstrate an understanding of, of that art. Um, yeah, and he never uh, moved his camera. If you watch Ford's film, he hated moving the camera. Rare, rarely ever did it. So it was, uh, it was interesting techniques that he would that he would. That's why he hated Cinerama when he made uh, How the West Was Won, and he hated CinemaScope. But oh, right. He realized those were the industry standards. He just he hated those, those huge, wide compositions. He loved the intimacy of... Um, of uh, just uh, shooting quickly, unlike Willie Wyler, who would shoot 30, 40 scenes, uh, takes of each scene. Ford usually nailed it in, in you know, one or two. It's what, what was called editing in the camera, which is where he would, you know, you'd get the spontaneity of the first one or two takes, and then that's it. He'd print whatever he had. So interesting, interesting techniques. It's kind of ironic. Yeah. That's like, you know, today, I mean, you can't watch a movie without that type of format. 70 millimeter. Yeah. You're, you're, you're almost obliged. Uh, any director, unless you're Martin Scorsese, you want to shoot in black and white 35 millimeter, it's, just, it's, it's not an industry standard anymore. You're, you're, you're a dinosaur. But he did, like, like Monet, you know, after Monet went blind, all he did was he painted on bigger canvases, wider vistas. And Ford basically did the same thing. After CinemaScope came in, he just he, he learned to adapt. So he wasn't, he, wasn't a, uh, he wasn't a relic. He wasn't a Victorian uh, director by any means. He really, he was, he was a man of his times. And when the industry changed, he, he got on board because he just, he loved to make what he called pictures. So that, that he just, he just adapted, which is interesting too. Says a lot about the man. Now let's go back to, uh, John Ford and John Wayne's relationship. Um, you know, as we mentioned, it, it was, it had a lot of twists and turns and complications to it as, as filmmaking partners, they were, uh, they got along great. In fact, John Ford said that John Wayne was his, his favorite actor, which is why they worked yeah. together so many times. But, I don't know, politically, personally, it was a little bit rocky. Um, they had po- <laughs> political differences, which yeah. I'm sure you can elaborate more on that than I can. Yeah, well, uh, as you know, Ford, until uh, the tumult and upheaval of uh, the 60s, was always always a left leaning uh, left leaning uh, Democrat, pro union, pro FDR, pro New Deal uh, through the forties. Always always voted uh, Democrat. Matter of fact, when John Wayne was having his uh, uh, cancer surgery the first time in sixty five, he was sitting or sixty four, as he was sitting with his wife Pilar, John Wayne's wife Pilar, waiting for news. Uh, the, the the finest, the greatest uh, Hosanna. And compliment that Ford ever paid to Duke Wayne is when he told his wife, he says, you know what, I love that damn Republican. Because <laughs> 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 he, he thought that Duke was a, a reactionary, and he, 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 he was sorry to see that he got involved with all the, uh, the, the that, that sort of conservative bastion of, of Cecil B. DeMille and uh, Walt Disney and Ward Bond when they, they, they took sides in the, the red stuff in the, in the 50s. So they, they, they did disagree heartily, but uh, oddly enough, Fred, it was it was it was it was Wayne who finally brought Ford over to more to the Republican camp, and he ended up becoming a Nixon Republican in his in his in his later years, very strongly supportive of Nixon because he he hated what he saw happening to his country. He hated Vietnam, but he knew it was his country. He had to support his country. He hated uh, the uh, what the kids were doing, like John Wayne. 
hated what the kids were doing on campuses. So he became sort of an angry, angry conservative in his in his later years. But up till then, they were they were constantly, constantly at odds over politics. You know, and it's interesting. Speaking of politics, um, well, there's John Ford on one side, and then have this image of John Wayne being equally as passionate about his politics on the you know on the Republican side of things but initially John Wayne didn't really have any political ambitions in particular he was just trying to make movies and take care of his family yeah and uh, in fact he didn't even he wasn't even going to be a part of the war when World War II happened and wasn't it John Ford that really pushed him that you know you need to you need to fight for your country uh, Talia, Rep, that's uh, that's I, that that probably would take a whole chapter of a book of of uh, because that probably is is the most contentious and as you know probably the most controversial aspect of John Wayne's life was he was this this proto patriot and and champion of America and a super macho hero, but he, yeah he did not serve and then uh, Ford made no secret of his disdain for the fact that Wayne for whatever reasons there are many reasons that are proffered. Um, they range from the fact that he, he was he was severely injured from his stunt days uh, and the fact he had four dependencies, which means he was legally entitled to a deferment, to the fact that he was just getting started in his career, getting better roles, and he just couldn't pull the trigger and leave a very lucrative career behind. I mean, he wasn't a Jimmy Stewart. He wasn't a, a Clark Gable. He wasn't part of the studio system. He was, he was on his own, and he was basically making his own career. Yeah. And leaving to go off for several years to fight the war, would have impeded that, but um, it's a subject. It's a hot button topic, and I it's, it, it would take somebody with better chops than me to really figure out what really happened with 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 Wayne and and, and the war. But it was mm. gave him no end of of, of regret and shame, uh, and a lot of people say that's what he was a compensation. That's why he became this this supercharged he man ultimate warrior after the war was in, in, in many ways to compensate for that. Well, essentially, John Ford kind of woke John Wayne up. Kind, he's he's kind of responsible for instilling John Wayne's sense of American value and morality, mm-hmm. which is why, mm-hmm. kind of later in Wayne's career, he started to be more. He started to speak out more. In fact, he even made a political film during the Vietnam era, The Green Berets. Is that at all a result of John Ford's uh, encouragement? Uh, interesting, interesting question, and I, I, I guess, I guess it would have to be seen. The answer would have to be seen on on many levels because it, the answer is yes, yes, and no. I think the the guts and the courage to to stand up and speak out that was that was Wayne's own personality. He was one of the, he was one of the most lovable and likable guys in Hollywood. Uh, never held a grudge. Uh, very generous. Very warm to everybody. But sometimes he really believed on his own. And uh, you know, when 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 Ford was still pretty much heavily into left-leaning democratic liberalism. Ford, or Wayne kind of, on his own, independent of what, what, what Ford thought, he kind of took the, the opposite tack, and he really stood up for anti-communism and conservative values. So a lot of that came from his own sense of being. But then again, uh, remember, it was Ford that gave him and helped him form the matrix of this larger-than-life character that in a ways gave Wayne the, the the chops, if you will, to to be able to stand up and say these things in a way that they wouldn't have listened to a Fred McMurray, they wouldn't have listened to a, a Van Johnson, who were other big stars at the time. So a lot of that persona to say these things, which were counter to what Ford believed in, actually did come from Ford, if that makes any sense. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. In in John Ford's movies, he there's almost a uh, it's al- mm-hmm. it's almost like John Wayne's character is there's a reluctance to to be the hero if you get what I'm saying. Mm. I'm thinking of movies like The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. Was that do you think is a is a statement at all about yeah, that's... How, his vision of America or something? Yeah, actually, you know what? Uh, that's another good observation is that uh, because again, Wayne's character did not have its roots in the, the Gene Autry, Roy Rogers blitziness of, uh, like we were talking before. It has its roots in, in what, uh, in, the, in the parlance of silent westerns, was called the good bad man, like William S. Hart, uh, Francis Ford, uh, Harry Carey especially, was this man who you, you get the feeling there's, there's, there's something about him. There's, there's a virtue, there's an integrity, but you also get the feeling that, uh, you know, he could, he, could, he could 
drink a lot of whiskey and shoot you through the heart. So there's a dark edge. There are dark edges. There's dark corners around his his integrity and his noble heroics. So it's a it's a kind of a a balance between the light and the dark, not the the transcendent beauty of the heroes of of the Gene Autry, Roy Rogers type. So yeah, that's uh, there is a reluctance, and I think that if you look at the the films that Ford made after the war in the late forties and fifties, there's also a hesitation of being too boldly heroic and militaristic because he'd just come out of four years of the war and he'd seen what, what war and aggression can do. Mm. So he began to, you begin to see in Lane's characters, especially in Fort Apache and in She Wore Yellow Ribbon, this, this kind of warning as to where blind, naked aggression and militarism can lead. So that's kind of Ford's uh, mythological statement uh, about what was happening in America at the time between the, the, the Cold War and aggression, the nuclear, nuclear bomb, so yes, there is a there is a hesitation. Well, well, well stated on your part, to be entirely heroic, and that's why his best films dealt with kind of the dark corners of of uh, Wayne's persona, like the Searchers and Man Who Shot Liberty Balance. Yeah, in fact, that was the that was the n- next example I was going to point out. That's like the the epitome of that is the Searchers. Oh yeah, yeah. Very dark and very. Um, I mean. In that movie, he finds himself in a position where he doesn't he doesn't want to be in this position, but circumstances are kind of forcing him to do that, and mm-hmm. you know he just takes charge. So anyway, just just kind of a personal observation from from my experience. Um, oh yes, yeah, spot on. Yeah, spot on with that. But um, has John Ford ever made a statement as to what his favorite film is that he made? <laughs> It was another thing that uh, it would change depending on his mood. Um, he always said that uh, he enjoyed uh, The Quiet Man, obviously, because that represented one of the, the happiest times in his life, being on location in Ireland. It was, it was a very, very, very peaceful, rewarding time. Other times he would say, How Green Was My Valley, um, The Searchers. But he always, whenever he would give a, a list, always a number one or number two, was a very interesting little film he made in 1953 called The Sun Shines Bright. Have you ever, have you ever seen that one, Ray? I have not. It was, uh, it was a very interesting little curio that, was, that, that came and went unseen. It basically was a remake of uh, a, a film he did in the 30s with uh, Will Rogers, one of those the three films, great films that he made with uh, Judge, where he was Judge Priest in, in, in the Deep South in the turn of the century, dealing with uh, a prostitute who comes home and she's given birth out of wedlock and the hypocrisy of the, the people, and uh, there's a lot of stories tied in, and it ends with her funeral, and the town people all show up. Ford always said that he thought that was his, his, his best work, his finest work, because it was, it really, I mean, it, it's just a supremely mature example of a storyteller at his very best. It was just Ford telling a story, and not dealing in, in these deep themes and heavy, you know, stuff. It was just a beautifully told fable. And Ford always said that that was his favorite film, but other times he'd say other ones, where he just told these beautiful fable-like stories with a very gentle, easy pace and feeling to them, uh, which includes The Wagon Master, The Quiet Man, Three Godfathers. And after that, after uh, Sunshine's Bright, aside from The Searchers, the, the rest of the, his career was really just a, 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 a melange, a mixed bag of, of very, very good and very, very mediocre films. Now I gotta I gotta mention the Alamo, John yeah. Wayne's directorial debut. That was a movie that to me, it was actually kind of disappointing because the Alamo is a great story and it's been done before, but as I watch the movie, it it's just it's very, I don't know. It I have a hard time staying interested in it. But John Wayne's John Wayne, uh, his efforts to to make this movie. I mean, he's very passionate about it. His desire to direct. Was that a result of John Ford's influence on him? Yeah, he. Uh, if you if you read a lot of interviews with uh, with Wayne, or read books, he really his desire really was to direct. And I, I know that's sort of the standing joke in Hollywood. There, there was a, a famous T-shirt that was going around in the eighties that said, uh, "What I really want to do is direct," because that's what every star says that they want to do. But John Wayne <laughs> really truly did enjoy directing. And the only way he could get the funding from uh, United Artists and the different people he raised money for 
was if he took the, the starring role as well as Davy Crockett, he did not want to star in it. Um, he just wanted to do the directing. And uh, you talk about it being long, try seeing it in France, in France the way I did in the 80s. It's quite a surreal experience. Um, but the, also contrary to popular myth is that uh, the movie was, was a bomb, and it was not a bomb. Wayne did not get back the money he put in because he put everything he owed. But United Artists made made a fortune, especially overseas, and then right. on TV. Oh yeah, so it's now it has a cult status, and they've restored a lot of the lost footage, and so it's uh, it's considered really one of the finest epics of uh, the fifties and sixties. But uh, for Elaine, yes, did want to direct, was passionate about it, pretty good hand at directing too. But the only, and I'm sure you know this story, is two weeks into filming in Brackettville, Texas, finally his twenty year dream of bringing the Alamo to the screen is being realized. And who shows up out of nowhere? Pappy. Yeah. Shows up. Second unit down director. In the director's chair. Finally gave him the, a camera and sent him off into the desert to do some second unit shooting because, in 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 his eyes, this was a joint directing thing between him and Duke. He was he was just as involved as Duke was, and Duke was like, "Holy, you know, what am I going to do with him? He's he's not going to leave." So they finally gave him a camera, sent him out into the desert, and. Let him do some second unit shooting, but it was a it was a it was a gulp moment where Duke thought, "Oh no, that's it. What am I going to do?" Wow. And that sort of uh, that sort of was the bellwether for what their relationship was like in the '60s, because in in Duke's eyes, the debt had been repaid. Uh, every time Ford called, said, "Duke, time to make another movie." You get Ward Bond, you get the crew together, they go make a film. John Wayne was a grandfather in the '60s. He was, he was, you know, the number one star in in the world. He didn't want to still go cap in hand and have to, you know, uh, be be under the thumb of Pappy. So he really was kind of tired by that point and said enough's enough. So they only made a few more films together by '62, '63. That was it. No more. He couldn't. Excuse me. John Wayne just couldn't make any more with him. So going back to your original questions at the beginning. Even to the end, it was a very, very complex and complicated relationship and not the glorious collaboration that, that everybody thinks it was. So after Donovan's Reef, because of that, that's when they just, was it a conscious decision to just say we need to part ways? Mm-hmm. And then um, Duke's, uh, the cancer, uh, the cancer was uh, a following year after Donovan's Reef, and that changed Duke. And uh, in order to recoup the losses that he had incurred on the Alamo, Wayne literally put himself on a breakneck schedule of film, like two, three films a year for the, the remainder of his, of his career. He had to keep working. And uh, Ford was getting older by that point. He made Cheyenne Autumn in 1964. Very expensive, very long epic. And uh, it was a total bomb. It tanked at the... Uh, talk about unwatchable films. I've never been able to get through Cheyenne Autumn. Huh. And so Ford was showing signs that he was just out of steam. He just couldn't do it anymore. And that was his last one. No, his last uh, his last feature film was in 1966 called Seven Women, which oh. was an interesting studio piece, but not much not much steam was generated. Seventy seven. Uh, no, Seven Women. No, no, I mean the year it was made was that? Oh, 66. 66. 1966. Oh, okay, okay. Was his last feature film. I was just curious because um, I know that John Ford was the first recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award by the American Film yes. Institute, and that happened in 73. 73, right. So I, I was just curious was as to how far apart that was from his last movie. Well, he made a few more documentaries. He made um, he made Vietnam, Vietnam, which was kind of a, a documentary tribute to the Vietnam War. Like the Green Berets, it was, it was, he was totally out to sea. Uh, it was a, a movie that could have been made during World War II, not during the world, not during the Vietnam War. It was completely dismissed. Made a few more documentaries, and then um, by '73, that was it. He was uh, ravaged by cancer, which is why they hurried along the uh, all the awards and the documentaries. Because by the time he was at the podium there receiving the achievement award, he was uh, he was very close to death and almost unrecognizable from the cancer. I have a few uh, exclusively John Wayne related questions for you. Mm-hmm. Um. I want to talk about Bat Jack Productions. That's the uh, production company that that John Wayne started. Um, right. It was in a, he, he. There were certain kind of movies that he wanted to make at one point, and he couldn't ever get the approval from Hollywood to make these movies. And so Bat Jack Productions was the result of that. 
more than anything, I just was wanted to mention it and just get your your comments about that. Oh yeah, it's um, I, I, uh, I yeah, I commend your your knowledge of that. Um, and you know where it came from. You know we, how he got the the name Badjack. Yeah, it came from, from uh, Wake of the Red Reap Witch. The Wild Wind. Or Wake of the Red Witch or Reap the Wild Wind. It was the name of the uh, the company. Yeah, the ship company. Yeah. And he uh, it was it was it had a K at the end. And when his secretary was filing the um, uh, incorporation papers, she left the K off. Right. And so he and so, didn't. But that's in, instead of you know getting mad at her, he just decided, oh, we'll just we'll just keep it the way it is then. Again, that's and yeah, it's a neat little story. But not, more to your point. Uh, Everybody seems to think, and another misnomer about John Wayne, uh, that he's just, he was just this 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 big kind of uh, uh, lug-headed cowboy who didn't uh, do anything but horse operas. But, you know, Wayne was, was, was a very smart man. He was a self-made man in the industry. Uh, like I said, he didn't come through the studio system. He, he had to gain every single inch of ground that he gained. He had to fight for himself. And uh, very smart in terms of movie-making. He enjoyed producing very much. He, he would much would have rather just producing films, because at the at the break of the studio system, Wayne really I mean he was kind of a pioneer. You had guys like uh, uh, Willie Wyler and, and Frank Capra and John Ford going independent, and Wayne jumped on that bad wagon, and he just didn't make his own movies, but he was also a forum, much the same way that the Apple Records became with the Beatles, kind of a a, a place where. Guys with good projects could come when they're when they're shut out by the uh, the industry, and so you had like all these great films like uh, uh, the the Bullfighter and the Lady, some great Bud Bedecker westerns. Bud Bedecker was a very fine western director in prominence, you know, prominent in the fifties. Right, and he's, he made all these cult films, these westerns that are considered cult. These are all Batjack films that that Wayne gave the green light to. So, very much a visionary in terms of uh, of, of independent film. Very smart guy, and um, knew the industry very well. And uh, like I said, he was he became the, the catalytic agent for a lot of these great kind of films flying under the radar, but today have a, a very fine reputation and cult status. And it was during the bat, under the Batjack banner that he recruited James Arness, mm -hmm. who would later go on to be the star of Gunsmoke. But I guess I'm kind of curious if you know anything about this at all. This is purely my personal interest. It may not be of interest to anyone else at all. We know very well how John Wayne felt towards John Ford. Um, James Arness has considered John Wayne to be a mentor to him. Do, do you know anything about how John Wayne felt about James Arness? Well, I, you know, they made a movie together. Uh, he was in several Ford films. He was he was one of the goons in the background in uh, Wagon Master. Right. Uh, but then he was also in Big Jim McLean with uh, with the Duke, where they played uh, commie hunting uh, federal agents. Right. But that's probably the greatest legacy to that 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 Ford bequeathed to John Wayne. In the same way that that Ford surrounded himself with people and help people on their careers, and probably help more stars to go on to Academy Award-winning performances in his films and out of his films. John Wayne picked up that same thing, and he surrounded himself with his own stock company. After, you know, when he, in the 60s and 70s, after he parted company with them, to see all these young actors that he used again and again and again, same directors, same uh, uh, technicians, and he felt the same way about Jim Arnett, because in many ways, Jim Arnett looked like John Wayne. They were very. They, they they almost looked alike. They were very they same height, same build, same background. Yes. Um, in, in terms of ethnic makeup, and he saw this guy, and he, he realized that the debt he owed the industry was to help other people along. And he never, you know, he was he always used young actors, Frankie Avalon, Fabian, um, Ricky Nelson, in his films as a way that he could act as a catalytic agent and a launch pad, which is what which is what he did. So loyalty to friends was a was a trait that uh, Ford bequeathed uh, to Wayne, and John Wayne was was a very good steward of his powers because he always used it to help young actors get get started in the business. And I think the first one really was was Jim Arnaz. That's that's very interesting. As a fan of both, I I really appreciate that that story. <laughs> um, good, good. Um, let's see. I don't really have any question in particular in regards to this next thing, but I'd love to hear any comments you have about it. John Wayne finally, after many, many years in the industry, finally got his Oscar after he made True Grit. I believe he was nominated one other time for The Sands of Iwo Jima. 
Correct, I'm 49. And it's, you know, it's been said that he really, he really cherished that award because he finally felt like he was accepted by his peers in Hollywood. He felt like people finally considered him to be a serious actor. But do you have any comments in regards to that at all? Yeah, again, Red, I, I, I think uh, the, the, the power and how moving it was for him to finally win his Academy Award and for the entire, uh, the entire uh, Dorothy Chandler Pavilion to stand up and applaud him, we think, well, that's only because he was John Wayne. You know? But if you put it in context, the year before, when he made um, the Green Berets, he was the most hated man in Hollywood. Because by that time, all the great conservative Republicans, Reagan was, was out of the industry, George Murphy was out of the industry, uh, a lot of the other guys were retired. John Wayne really, along with Bob Hope, was, was one of the last of the, the, the conservatives. But when Wayne made it to the Green Berets, they hated him. And he was and the, the New York Times trashed the movie and said, we'll never take John Wayne seriously again. He's made a complete fool of himself. He's acting as a mouthpiece of the U.S. government. He's helping send our boys over there to die. So if you see what, what, what had happened a year before, how he was despised by the industry. And then he made this film where, you know, he let his hair grow out, his wore a longer toupee, and playing a drunken, kind of a drunken fool with a, with a you know, strong noble center, and just almost like a parody of himself and a parody of the genre, all of a sudden these same people that were ready to tar and feather him, if not, you know, ride him out of town on a rail, right. were suddenly raising hosannas to him because Wayne was smart and he knew he had to do something. He had to pull a hat trick with his career because he was a survivor. And when, when uh, Portis's novel came out, he said, this is it. This is, this is my role. And so he optioned, he tried to option the book, but Henry Hathaway beat him to it. But he decided uh, to accept the offer to play uh, Rooster Cogburn. And, he, and they just loved it because he, he, he was more in tune with the disaffected youth, playing this old kind of uh, grumpy marshal who's, who's, you know, very, very shady and a drunk. And it was very countercultural. It was, it was going against all this seemingly conservative values. And they turned around and they, they tripped over themselves with praises for his, for his role. So when you see it in the context of what he really was a year before, brilliant move on Wayne's part. And that's why I think it was so moving to see the entire industry stand up. And he won out over, you know, Richard Burton and Peter O'Toole and Dustin Hoffman. So it was a pretty stiff competition. But for him to get the, uh, like you said, the, the affirmation and respect of his peers who a year before thought he was dead, in terms of his career. Yeah. It, it's a pretty astounding moment in, in Hollywood history. Well, and, and you can watch the the uh, him actually receiving the award and giving his speech. It's on YouTube, I believe. And, you know, he's he's noticeably humble and, and emotional. And, and, uh, and yeah, he is crying. That's yes, a side, he, is, that's he, is, a, he is crying. It's a side that you never see of, of John Wayne, ever. Trying to wrap this up here a little bit... Um, so we got John Ford and John Wayne, who today are still considered some of the best uh, filmmakers ever. Pe- people still continue to emulate John Ford in his filmmaking techniques, and John Wayne is still in the top ten of, of the greatest movie stars 40 years after his death. Isn't that amazing? It, that is amazing. Astounding? Yes. Yeah. My, 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 my nephews and great-nephews know who John Wayne is. Yeah. I know. I love his films. And they it's, weren't it's, even it's alive really... when he was when he was around. What can Hollywood take away from the careers of John Wayne and John Ford? What is their what is their legacy? I think Ford's uh Ford's vision, Ford's art, even though he said there was no art, Ford's whole life, his whole his whole persona, I think is is, is enmeshed in the DNA of Hollywood. And even though that those a lot of those things are retrograde today. Of, of myth and history and tradition and values and family. It's already in the DNA, and you can't, you can't wash it out because it's part of the legacy of Hollywood. And I think that all serious directors at one time in their career would have looked and studied the films of John Ford. You can't, you can't avoid it because of his, his legacy and his reputation. You can't outflank him. And I think that it's, it's, it's enmeshed in the lore of Hollywood and the traditions of Hollywood. And so I think that his values and his his, his art uh, are there, and it can never it can never be it can never be erased. And the same thing with with John Wayne. And I think the further we get away from something, paradoxically, like like G.K. Chesterton, I mean, so many truths are revealed in paradox. 
the more we get away from the America of John Wayne and John Ford, the more people are going to long for it and look back to it. Uh, the same way that people in industrialized urban America in the early 1900s looked back to the sort of primitive beauty of, of the West and the primal nature of, of the vast open spaces, and thus we had a revival of the, the cowboy film. We had the, the emergence of the cowboy film. So I think the further we get away from what Duke and Pappy were and stood for, paradoxically, people are going to return to it more often. At least I, at least I hope so. Yeah. Well, hey, Joseph, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. It's been a pleasure. It's a pleasure. It's a uh, pleasure, Red. You're highly, uh, highly uh, intelligent and literate, and it's fun to talk to you. Oh. Talk, to, talk to somebody who knows their stuff. Well, thank you so much. Uh, the name of the book is John Ford, Poet in the Desert. It's available at Amazon.com, and uh, your website is josephmalham.com. I'll let you go, Joseph. Thanks again. Thanks again.